This is Storybeat, storytellers on storytelling. Storybeat explores how artists and creators of all kinds craft their stories. So join us as we reveal how master storytellers develop and build brilliant stories that people the world over love and adore. I'm Steve Cuden, and welcome to Storybeat, coming to you from the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University in the heart of downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today is a man of many talents, the writer, producer, director Paul Chitlick, who also happens to be one of the very best screenwriting teachers in the world. First, a bit of background. In his career, Paul has developed over 2,500 scripts for film and television in both English and Spanish. He's also written, directed, or produced over 300 episodes of TV or films, including The New Twilight Zone, Who's the Boss, Brothers, Amen, Perfect Strangers, Small Wonder, Los Beltran, VIP, Alien Abduction, and American Playhouse. He produced and directed numerous episodes of U.S. Customs Classified and Real Stories of the Highway Patrol. In 2014, he wrote, produced, and directed the feature The Wedding Dress. He's also published three novels, including Deviant Numbers, Burns with an E, and Rug Burns. Paul has taught thousands of students the best way to develop and write screenplays. I'm proud to say I was twice lucky enough to be one of Paul's students while I was attending UCLA's screenwriting program. He's also taught screenwriting at ESCOC, the premier film school of the University of Barcelona, Spain, EICTV, the film school of Cuba, and he currently serves as a clinical assistant professor of screenwriting at Loyola Marymount University's School of Film and Television. For those of you who've never had the good fortune to take a Paul Chitlick class, you may want to obtain his indispensable book on screenwriting simply called Rewrite. I am beyond honored and pleased to have Paul Chitlick as my guest on Storybeat. My friend, welcome. Steve, thank you very much. I'm blushing still from your introduction. Well, you, you've earned it and deserve it. So thank you. let me ask you this. You know, what attracts you to a story in the first place? You've worked on literally hundreds of them. What attracts you to a story that you may want to write? What, what gets your attention? What, what, what attracts me to a story that I want to write is different than what attracts me to a story that I want to read. Um, a story I want to read is something that is different, something that I haven't read before. A story that I want to write is just something that comes out of my own experience that makes me want to express that in a way that other people can feel the same way I felt in that particular situation. So it's about emotion? It's about emotion. It's all about emotion. That's why we go to movies, is to feel something. Uh, we go to scary movies to be afraid. We go to love stories to feel love. We go to comedies to laugh. So they're all emotions that we want to uh, experience outside of our normal daily lives and to lift us out of our normal daily lives. So movies are all about emotions and people and their relationships, and that's what we go to see. Mm -hmm. And, and is there, are there particular elements for you in, in stories in general or even in specific that makes a good story good? Is there something special? Well, it's always about how people relate to each other and the difficulties they have in achieving those relationships and achieving their goals. So what we see in good stories is conflict. Actually, if you don't have conflict, you don't have a story. That's the definition of story. You got nothing. Yeah. There's a person with a goal, and there's a wall between him and the goal, and he has to go over, under, around, or through the wall to get to the goal. It's as simple as that. But we want to see on the journey of getting to the goal that the person changes from who they were, the imperfect person that they were, to a more perfect person at the end of the story. At least that's what we hope we see. That's, that's the heroic journey, but that's also um, the journey of daily life. We all want to be better people, at least uh, the people that I know want to be better people. And we strive to be better selves uh, in our everyday lives, and we are hoping to see that happen on the screen as well. Living, vica vi living vicariously through the lives of the folks that we're watching on screen. 
correct. And we also want to use them as examples and, and, and people to follow. So if we see something on the screen, if we see somebody facing difficulties on the screen, we want to be able to play, apply what he or she learns to our own lives so that we can improve our own lives. So and, go ahead. I'm sorry. It may not, may not be a conscious decision when we go to movies to see that. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure it's not a conscious decision. But as writers, that is what we're promoting. And so you've you've had the the uh, the fortune to work in many different uh, genres: dramas, comedies, mm-hmm. reality, sci-fi, detectives, and so on. Is there one genre on which, if they said you're stuck forever writing it, that you would prefer over another? Ah, uh, that's hard um, because I think it would fall between comedy and science fiction. Strangely enough, I think those are two sides of the same coin. Comedy is a particular way of looking at life, and science fiction is another particular way of, of looking at life and extending it out into the possibilities that life can offer. Comedy is extending out a situation into the f- funny possibilities that it can offer. So, so in other so, words, it, 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 I have... What I try to teach sometimes, not all the time, but I try to teach that story is story. It's a matter of how you angle it. Right. No, absolutely. Uh, You know, when you write comedy, you have to write a story first, and then you have to make it funny. Now, part of that making it funny is putting it into the right kind of situations and putting the right type of people in those situations. Writing science fiction, as we used to say in the Twilight Zone, you take an ordinary person and you put them in an extraordinary situation. So in a certain way, that's another way to write comedy, fish out of water. You can, you can look at that. And those are, that's a traditional way to set off um, a comedy, is putting somebody in a situation that they're unfamiliar with mm-hmm. and seeing them react. Same thing on Twilight Zone. So uh, when you write science fiction, you're writing good stories. At least we hope we're writing good stories. And you're writing them in a sometimes a different world, sometimes the same world, but uh, in the future, or sometimes uh, it could be anything. That's the thing about science fiction. It could be anything, anywhere, anytime. So, so uh, cl- clearly you're multi-talented in terms of which genre you want to go into, and you're multiverse. Uh, t- uh, I would say, I don't know what the right word is, multi multi um, versatile in various <laughs> different genres. And so uh, there isn't one I'm gathering, even though you're saying comedy and sci-fi, but all of them are an, an appealing to you in some way. Yeah, uh, you, you take the last movie that I wrote. Well, it's not the one uh, last one I, I've written since I did the, the Wedding Dress. The Wedding Dress just is a story about relationships between people who have difficulties because of the people that they love, and the difficulties are mostly societal difficulties. Um, in the story is actually three stories about a, a continuing, um, about a family. And in the first story, it is about a relationship during World War II where a British woman is, uh, is proposed to by a Jewish-American soldier. So there's two strikes against him, according to the British woman's mother. First, he's American, and second, he's Jewish. Or maybe he's Jewish and American. Either way, it doesn't matter, but... She, the family is very much against that. Then the daughter of that couple uh, turns out to be a lesbian. And so she faces, in 1967, when uh, things were very difficult for lesbians, they weren't out yet, she wants to get married, which was an unheard of situation at that time. Uh, and then the woman uh, progresses in, in 2014. Now she is a professor at uh, Berkeley and professor of psychology. And one of her protégés wants to get married to an illegal immigrant. So I tackled those stories because it was interesting to me to see people who were in love find difficulties that were imposed upon them by society. Now, what does that have to do with science fiction? Not very much. What does that have to do with comedy? <laughs> Not very much. But it was just something that attracted me. My latest thing is about a, a, a person who was in a rock and roll band in high school and lost his girlfriend to the singer in the rock and roll band and decides to abandon music altogether and go into dentistry. And 50 years later, he's facing, or 45 years later, he's facing the return of that girlfriend and that singer in the rock and roll band and all the things that that represents. 
So it's a comedy, but it's a musical comedy. So you think, what the hell does this guy focus on anyway? And the, the truth is I focus on relationships, no matter what situation I find them in. I focus on the difficulty that people have in forming relationships. It's, it's always about unique characters in conflict with other unique characters, yeah? Exactly. Exactly. So, couldn't, um, have done it, couldn't have said it better. Okay, good. Well, um, uh, you know, you have both produced, you've written, you've directed, you've done all these things. Um, tell us the difference in movies and TV. What are the differences in writing a um, a TV script versus writing a feature film, if any, other than length? Are there major differences? Uh, well, these days, the lines are blurred. It used to be that the TV was more confined, and you had to get your story in, let's say it was a sitcom, you had to get your story in 22 minutes and 30 seconds. And so you usually had two acts, sometimes you had had three acts, but generally it was a problem leading to another problem. Uh, if it was a one-hour show, you had, uh, depending on the way the network structured between four and, and uh, six acts, and you had to get your story in that, and you had a break for commercials, so you had to write towards commercials, which is a difficult thing to do. You had to write rising action at commercials. In film, you had the opportunity to do just about anything you wanted to do in a film, um, risking, of course, uh, the fact that people wouldn't want to go to see it if it wasn't very interesting. But you could do anything. These days, however, in television, you can do anything that you want uh, as long as you can get somebody to pay for it, like Netflix or HBO or Amazon. You can expand a story well beyond the 22 minutes and 30 seconds or 46 minutes and 30 seconds that a one hour used to have. Uh, for example, I just saw the adaptation of a novel, um, Big Little Lies, on HBO. Fantas and the whole fantastic, thing and wasn't it? Yeah, it was really great, except for the ending, and I'll talk about that in a second if you want. But uh, everything was very gripping, and it was all about relationships between people and the difficulties that people create um, for other people, knowingly and unknowingly. Uh, and that's something we couldn't do in a film anymore, but it was something that used to be done in films. Why, why can't you do it in film anymore? Yeah, there's a difficult question. You you literally can do it in film, but can you get somebody to pay for it for you to do in film? That's another question. Because is there there may not be an audience for it. Correct. Well, there, it's not so much that there's not an audience for it. It's that the the production companies and the networks, not networks, excuse me, I mean the studios, are not financing those kind of films because they're riskier. So something like Ordinary People would not get done today that would be a television uh, project. It would probably go more than two hours. It would probably go before four or five hours to really explore the whole thing. Well, almost none but, of those mid-level movies are being made, made anymore. Correct. A except by very risky people that are willing to take big risks and risk failure, and they do fail uh, at the box office because teenagers don't go see them. But those, so those folks that are willing to take the risk are, are willing to take it because what? Well, it's because um, they, are, they're, they have so many other things that are making so much money, they can take the risk. That is correct. Or, or they're uh, people with a, um, a passion project, people with money with a passion project, an actor with a passion project, a director or a... a or a producer with a passion project that says, I don't care if I make money or I don't make money. Or it's even somebody like Steven Spielberg, who years ago made a movie that nobody thought would ever get made, and that was Schindler's List. And he made that because um, his producers or his, his uh, studio said, okay, well, you can do that, Steven, as long as you make uh, Jurassic Park 2, then you can make this. And he said, okay, fine. And he made that, and as it turned out, it was probably his best film. And certainly made enough money so that the studio didn't say, Whew. okay, we're all right here. And, and, did, and uh, did fairly well on award season as well. Yes, it was an awards picture. Now, these days, uh, awards pictures um, generally don't make very much money. It's very rare that they do. Now, this year, um, I'm trying to think Moonlight. of Moonlight. Moonlight. Moonlight didn't make very much money. Uh, it made enough money to to pay its uh, its producers back or its its funders back. Also, the movie uh, about the um, NASA women, um, Hidden Figures. Hidden Figures. Yep. Uh, oh, it's a rare movie that's made for. Well, I guess that was probably under twenty million dollars. It's a rare movie that's made for that price that makes money. 
that made a ton of money. And we're going to see maybe, we may see a couple of movies like that every year, but we're not going to see a lot of movies like that. We're going to see more Transformers 6 and Fast and Furious 12 and stuff like that. But the, but the, 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 the more dramatic or personal stories we're finding on TV in a variety of ways. That is correct. And the, the motion and picture the, industry the has gone toward is that On TV, you, can, you have time to explore, and there's no set limit as to how many episodes it has to be. These days, uh, Big Little Lies, for example, was only seven episodes, which I thought was really an interesting number. Well, that's more like the BBC. That's, right. That's the way they do it in England. They'll do seven or eight yeah. episodes and be done. Well, it's more like what we used to do in the 70s when we were making miniseries. Miniseries, yeah. And uh, miniseries like Roots uh, was, I forget how many hours Roots was, but I guess, I'm guessing it was eight or nine hours. Uh, probably started out with two-hour uh, introductory uh, episode, and then it was one hour after that. And, it, and also, it played on consecutive nights, as I recall, and it practically shut down the country. Everybody was watching that. That's right. It was like seven or eight nights in a row, I remember. Yeah, uh, and it was an incredible event. And then, so a lot of miniseries were made around that time. We're going back to that. We just don't call them miniseries anymore. We call them limited series, or or we find them on HBO, or we find them on Netflix, and we find them on Amazon.com, and we find them on Hulu. We find them all over the place because everybody's competing for the for the dollar. But the thing is, it gives an opportunity to tell stories that don't have a limited length. We, so, we're also seeing lots of stories on cable that are not running to conventional lengths at all, where they'll it's an hour-long show, it's blocked as an hour, but in fact it runs an hour and six minutes or an hour and 12 minutes. Right. And right. we're starting to see and that, and in a serialized way as well. Oh, yeah. And we've even seen sitcoms like that on cable. Like if you watch episodes yep. on Showtime, sure. that sometimes it's 29 minutes, sometimes it's 34 minutes. There's no regulation on that because there doesn't have to be. They, they don't have to follow the same reg rules and regulations that an on-air broadcaster has to follow. In well, terms of much like this, much like this podcast, I, we're, I'm able to run whatever length we want here. There's no, there's no rule, or I'm, I'm not in, fitting into a time slot. It's just whatever we feel like. You're a pioneer. Uh, well, I don't know about that, and and by the way, I'm not that good in the country. <laughs> Uh, so, don't so, give him a musket and hope, him, hope he shoots down a Oh, you don't want to put a musket in my hands, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so let's talk about a couple of other things in terms of process. Um, you've worked on series TV where you were working on multiple things at a time, not just one mm -hmm. item at a time. What do you do? What tricks do you have to keep everything straight when you're working on multiple stories or multiple projects at once? That's an interesting question. I don't think I've ever given that any thought, um, wh which is not to say that I don't do it, um, but I haven't thought about my process in that way. Uh, when I'm working on a TV show, we usually have a board or um, some type of record keeping so that we know who's working on what and at what stage they are. And by a board, I mean it, it could be anything from a chalkboard to a, um, a cork board where we put up um, – uh, index cards to note who's writing what and what stage they're at. And we can make those uh, colored to, to show what stage they're at. For example, uh, they pitched it, we got the story, they're out writing the story, then we change it to another color. And they've written the story and we've given them notes, and then we've changed it to the first draft, et cetera, et cetera. And we follow those on the board or in a notebook or whatever. Now, right now, I'm, I, I'm teaching at Loyola Marymount, and I have about 30 students, which means I have about 30 stories, and I keep them in my head, mostly. Um, I, obviously, I, we don't use paper anymore either, which is an interesting concept. Uh, we do it all um, electronically, and mm -hmm. I read everything in Adobe Reader, and I can mark right directly on the, uh, the script uh, from my iPad. So I keep track of them. So I have all their scripts and every um, progression of the script in my iPad. So if I want to look at a, a previous draft, I can just jump to it, and I can jump to it to any student's draft whenever I want to do that. So I guess there's no real way to say there's no one way to keep them all straight, but there is. A, you must do that or... You're sunk. So, so you, as you know, I'm also teaching right now, and so I just want to mm -hmm. compare notes on this because it's interesting to me. Uh, 
we, I have, I can't remember the stories in the first week or two, but by about the third or fourth week, I can tell you what every story is in every class that I have. Exactly. Uh, and that's a, that's a common thing among teachers. And not only that, two years later, when a student will walk up to me and say, hi, um, I'll recognize the student, but I won't remember his name. But if I, if I say, give me one line of your story, I'll immediately remember the rest of the story, and then I'll remember who the student is. Isn't that interesting? Why do you think that is? What do you think is going on in the brain with that? <clears throat> I think I have, uh, <laughs> I don't know, I have a, a, a current storage system, and I have a deep storage system. And the deep storage system stores all the stories for some reason and can relate uh, that my current story, if that student came up to me uh, one semester after I've, he's been in my class or she's been in my class, I won't remember their name. Unless it's but, me. Pardon me? Unless <laughs> it's you. Yes, I do, I do remember you and all the people in your class uh, but uh, because of you. But um, I don't know. You know, it is a strange thing, and it's something I've often commented on when I talk to people about that issue because I can also not – sometimes I can't remember anybody's name in the first week or two, but after the third week I remember everybody's name. It used to be in a previous life when I was an English as a second language teacher before I became a writer, I would have 30 or 40 students in my class with very unusual names from all around the world, and I would know all their names by the end of the first class. And that's because I wrote all their names on the board and I would refer to their names when I talked to talk to them. So I would look at them, then I would remember where their name was on the board and look at the name on the board, and then I'd look back at them. By the end of the class, I would know everybody's name. Mm -hmm. I so can't do that anymore. Yeah, you like me, like me, I'll bet you you can't remember what you had for breakfast either. Uh, you're right. You're right. But <laughs> And my wife says, yeah, but you can remember the girlfriend you had 30 years ago. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I can. Yeah. But that's a whole different thing in that, you know. So so you're you're you are um uh, obviously you're you're fluent in both English and Spanish. Is, are there any other languages you're fluent in? Uh I'm not fluent in Italian, but I can get along in Italian pretty well and I can get along in French pretty well. But you've written uh, in English and Spanish, but just those two languages, correct. yes? That's correct. Well, yeah. I say just as if that's not a major feat. Uh, <laughs> I'm I, limited to those two languages. So when you are working, when you're writing and reading and writing, I should say, in Spanish, does your brain suddenly switch over into Spanish and that's the way you're thinking? You know, that is another strange phenomenon. Uh, when I was learning Spanish, I was, well, I learned some Spanish when I was in college, the first and second year in college. And then I studied at the University of Madrid. And I was walking down the street one day in Madrid after a couple of months, actually more than a couple of months, after four, probably three or four months, and suddenly I realized that my interior monologue was in Spanish. And I thought, oh, I guess I'm there. Uh, you do think in a different way in a different language. Uh, things have a different order, and not only a different order that you have to think about gender, uh, and number and case and all kinds of other things in a different language that you don't have to think about in English. And it does give you a particular way of thinking. And sometimes I can only express something in Spanish or can only express something in English, especially when I'm talking to somebody that is also bilingual. Uh, we will go back and forth between the languages because certain things are expressed more easily or better or more specifically in one language or the other. Um, these days, because I'm in an English-speaking environment, I don't think in Spanish very often, but when I do start talking to somebody in Spanish, then the whole thing flips over and I think in Spanish for the rest of that conversation and anything in between and sometimes <laughs> for a little bit after that. It's hard to control and it's, uh, I don't really understand the process, but it's like there's a different part of the brain. Is it, now, is it when I, you're writing, also, is it, does it, does it change the way you think when you're writing it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You have to think differently in Spanish. So, because sometimes you put the subject at the end of the sentence, mm -hmm. or you put, um, well, you certainly always put the adjectives after the, the nouns. So that gives you a different approach to thinking about something. First, you think of um, book, then you think of color, then you think of size. So you put them in that order. It's like it's almost like uh, the way they write things in the army. Um, 
shoe brown military, you know, and then that's how it's listed in the in the index so you can find it. Sometimes it's a better way of thinking. Sometimes it's the worst way of thinking because everything has to be done according to gender. So you have to, think, you always have to assign a gender. You assign a gender to things, and it's odd because uh, the male uh, genitalia is um, has a female gender, huh. and the female genitalia can have a male gender. So you think, what the hell are they thinking when they make up those words? Well, but, well, the English language you know, is not exactly the easy, easiest language in the world. Right. <laughs> and so the the idea is it dis, it gives you another thinking and it also gives you another perspective so that when you're thinking about something um, in Spanish, when you're writing in Spanish, you have a different uh, approach to things. Would you say that affects your the storytelling itself? I mean, the, the, the basic storytelling? No, the storytelling is the same. So... Uh, at least in my mind it is. So when I teach in Spanish, uh, we go over the same things and we approach them in the same way. Uh, that is to say, it's the people, what is the issue with the people, how do they relate to each other, uh, what do they want, how do they get it, what are the obstacles to getting it. The same things relate to that. Um, however, Spanish film and American film are usually very different. I just saw a Spanish film the other day. I'm trying to remember the name of it. It's called Truman, and it's about uh, it's about a, a man who has emigrated to Canada, who returns to Spain, who returns to Spain to uh, visit a friend of his who's in the last stages of lung cancer, and the friend wants to find a good place for his dog to live after he dies. It's a very very soft film because the protagonist of the film is not the person that's looking for the place for the dog protagonist is kind of sitting there watching things happen and it's a uh, there's no struggle there's no real obstacles uh but it's all about the relationship between the two men and how that progresses how does it work without uh conflict and obstacles like that not well <laughs> so but as since it's made for an audience that's different from the audience that expects to see a hollywood type type film it's okay but it'll never make a dime in the United States mm. or in probably any other country besides Spain or possibly Latin America. And that is the appeal of Hollywood films and the, the, uh, the negative side of Hollywood films, too, is that we have created a genre. Well, we haven't created it. It, it depends on Greek um, plays, you know, from 2,500 years ago. But we have based our... our films on that structure and the world now expects to see that so even when they come up with another structure in their own country that has been working for decades or, or, or millennia it won't work outside of that country because no everybody's expecting to see a hollywood style film this is why chinese films uh don't do well overseas uh they could if they follow the hollywood structure but they don't uh, because they don't follow the hollywood structure and we expect to see that, and so do international audiences. And that's why our films do well there. Their films do not do well here. Well, it's been ingrained in humanity for, what, 2,700-plus years since Aristotle and the Greeks as to the, exactly. way that, the way that we perceive story. And if story isn't given to us in the way that we're expecting to see it, then we're confused by it or we don't know what's wrong something's wrong with it and that, that I right. see we I see that all the time and, and certainly with my my newer students which actually is a, a good segue into the my my curiosity about you working with beginning writers because I know you've uh -huh. worked with quite a few um, oh yeah uh, what would you say is our our hallmarks of what beginning writers do that they shouldn't do or that they should concentrate on that they don't well, beginning writers, first of all, they don't concentrate on um, they don't concentrate on the flaw of the character, the the need that the character has to change. That's the first thing they don't think about. The second thing they don't think about is conflict, and they don't understand that everything has to have conflict, or it's not really a story. The story's over. If you've achieved your goal without a conflict, there's no real story there. So. Those are the main things I would say that they have difficulty with. 
Then there's technical things that they had difficulty with, besides format and construction and and uh, the obvious layout of the page and things like that. They also want to rely on voiceover and flashbacks to tell their story, um, which is kind of cheating. But it's, it's, it's a way of telling a story around a campfire. But you really lose a lot of forward momentum uh, on the screen if you're telling everything in voiceover and flashbacks. You can use those to good effect if you use them in the right way. Uh, the other question you had, I think, was what are the good things? Or, I'm sorry, would you restate that second part of your question? Sure. Um, uh, what should they concentrate on that they shouldn't, or what should they not do that they com- commonly do? Those were the questions. Okay. So I, to- I, I went backwards, and I That's talked all right. about the things that they shouldn't do. Uh, the I'm, that they I'm, should all, do I'm is- often backwards, Paul, so it's fine. <laughs> I've been walking backwards lately, but that's a whole different thing. Um, the things that they should concentrate on are the things that we we look for in movies. Emotions. We look for flawed characters. Uh, people who aren't perfect. There's not a single perfect person in a movie that's interesting. Um, Superman was not perfect. He had flaws. And because he had flaws, he was interesting. Why did he have to hide his identity? Why was that important to him? Why couldn't he be himself? So if a superhero has flaws, then everybody's got to have flaws. And if they don't, then you're missing the boat. And then we have to see them in situations where we find them in difficulties. So, again, conflict comes into play. If there's no conflict, there's no story. So uh, it's not interesting. And we have to see them in different kinds of stories, in different kinds of places, um, not your ordinary places, except if we have an ordinary ordinary person in an extraordinary situation or we have an extraordinary person in an ordinary situation we have to see what happens there there has to be something different than our daily life and you find that an exaggeration of our daily life and you find that beginning writers uh, have a tendency to not focus on that stuff i find that and i also find that when they do focus it's sometimes it's hard to get them to focus but when they do focus a lot of times some of the stories I see from my beginning production writers, these are people that are in studying production, directing, uh, cinematography, things like that, and they have to write movies that they're going to be producing. Uh, they, we have to tell them, no, you can't solve the problem by killing somebody. No, you can't solve the problem by suicide. Uh, no, you can't have a story about a, a shy film student who wants to meet an outgoing uh, actress. Um, because we see that over and over and over again. So I ask them to dig into their own lives, not the present moment life, but things that happened to them in the past, and look for stories there, things that um, created difficulties for them, issues that came up that they didn't know how to deal with, and then create stories from that, and look at characters from their own experience, people that they know, um, I had a student I was talking to the other day who was having a hard time uh, writing about an old man. And he said, you know, I, this, the inspiration for this man was my grandfather. And my grandfather used to do this and that and the other thing. And I said, well, so why don't you put that in the script? Because that's what's interesting. That's what's real. And he said, yeah, I guess that's what I was looking for. I said, okay, now I'll do that. So, and this is a graduate student who's uh, writing for production, writing his thesis film. It's a 15-minute film. And he had everything except he didn't really make his grandfather stand in, um, have the, the peculiarities and the idiosyncrasies of his grandfather. And I think that's something that's missing in new students. They, they don't look at their, their real um, experiences. Experiences and they don't project them onto the screen. They're just looking at things that they've seen on television yep. and things that they've seen in the movie. Yeah, they, they feel like they have to emulate, imitate, whatever word you want to use, uh, that which they have seen, uh, and right. they have a tendency to want to then make up stories uh, you know, or make things up totally uh, based on what they've seen, and they, they don't think about their own lives first. And Not that you have to, but, it, but it's certainly quite useful to do that. Well, it's certainly the place to start. Uh, you know, a, a beginning writer should start with the things that they know. 
I'm not saying that you always have to write what you know, because I believe that you can write anything so long as you learn it so you can get to know it. Uh, Shakespeare did not know anything about Verona in the 14th century. Nor did James Cameron know anything about a Terminator before he wrote one. Right, or an Avatar. But he had a general idea how to create a story. He wrote many stories before that. He didn't know about crocodiles either, but he did write that. Sure. But but um, if you don't know anything, uh, look into your own life and write something about that first, and then you can start making up stuff because then you've learned the basics of writing and basics of story. And you've also learned that people have idiosyncrasies, people have um, flaws, People fuck up. People do things that probably are not good for them. Uh, but eventually they conquer them to achieve their goals. Mm -hmm. Most people do achieve some sort of goal or another. So so they, on top of that, the, the act of creation, once you've gotten past your most basic stuff in, in how to create story and how to develop um, an, a story arc and character and all that, um, and as I mentioned in the introduction, you you've written to me one of the seminal books of our day for screenwriting that I absolutely um, require in several classes of mine being rewrite, and um, it's it's absolutely one of my most useful favorite books in the screenwriting world. I'm just wondering if you could talk for just a moment about uh, the rewriting process and how important it is for writers of all kinds. Okay, well, first of all, thank you for the great plug. I, I do appreciate that. Um, and, you know, I make a fortune out of these books, almost 80 cents a book that's sold. So, Wow, uh, that much. That, <laughs> that adds up. Um, but I guess, you know, would you tell me your question again? I'm well, sorry, how, how it, you know, speak about the importance of the rewriting process and, uh, okay. and how, uh, it, how it's worthy, a worthy thing to consider for all writers of all kinds. Okay. First of all, Nothing you write the first time is perfect. Nothing you write the second time is perfect. Nothing you write the 25th time is perfect. It's never perfect. So people that think that they've written a perfect first draft just have to get off that high horse and understand that that's not true. It can't be true. It's impossible to be true. Uh, Ernest Hemingway said the first draft is always shit, and he was totally right, because it is. It's just the puke draft, and you're just putting it out there to see what you've got. And you haven't written anything at all yet until you have a first draft. And the first draft is something that now you are writing. Now you can take it up and say, okay, I can mold this, I can fix this. It's like um, if you were Michelangelo and the first draft is actually just cutting the piece of marble from the quarry. That's what you got the first draft. Now you have to chip away everything that is not the pieta. And that takes a long time. So first you have to do a rough kind of chipping away to get a general idea of where you're going with it. And then you start to chip away at individual pieces and grind and polish and form until you have a perfect face of Jesus. And then you have to work your way down the script, uh, down the, uh, the statue until you've completed it. And then of course, uh, you mount it and you get it set up in the Sistine Chapel or wherever the hell it's going to be, and you find that oh, it doesn't look good in that place. And then you have to move it, and then you have to maybe oh, you have to adjust it to to fit that place. Same thing happens with a movie. When you're writing a movie, you're writing a script. You find that first you have to block it out in kind of rough kind of ways. If first you you've prepared it, of course, you've written your biographies, you've written your outlines, you've written your your beat sheets, you've written your your treatments and uh, anything else that goes along with that. Then you've written your first draft. Now you have to sit down and start figuring out, oh, what needs to be shaped, what needs to be moved around, what needs to be formed, and you write that. And then you have to sometimes you write you do that three or four times and review that yourself. And, and of course, if you've read my book, you know how to review that. And then it's time to show it to somebody to see, does this fit in the place I want it to go? Meaning, does this fit in the theater? Does this fit on the screen? Does this fit in television? Does this fit as a web series? What, where does this fit? Am I right in thinking that it fits there? Um, is it something that people can understand? Because sometimes you get so convoluted in your own mind about how it looks and what it's supposed to be, you forget that 
you might not have said where the conflict is. You might not have really explained how this works. You might not have really shown a scene that has that goes from has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So you have to show it to people to get some feedback to see is it fit in the particular place that I want it to fit. So the process can be long and arduous. Sometimes uh, I did a poll once of writers at the Writers Guild to find out how many drafts they went through before they got it on the stage. And the average was 25. Wow. And most readers don't think about that. Now, 25 doesn't mean that they did a complete rewrite every time. No. But it does mean that they went through and they changed uh, a character's name or sometimes they went through and took out a character because they couldn't get that actor or they didn't need that actor or didn't have enough money for that actor or that actor was sick that day or they lost a location or they gained a location. So it's not always that they have to change the story, but it sometimes can be. And sometimes you can change the story like 15 drafts down down the road and you go, oh my God, I want to pull my hair out. But you have to find, you have to admit sometimes I screwed up. It would be better if I did this, and you have to just go and do it. People are reluctant to do that because they think what well, was good enough before, and it's so much work to change it. But if you don't change it, it's not going to be as good as it could be. So you have to ask yourself at the end of every draft, is this the best that I can possibly do before I show it to somebody else? Mm-hmm. I, I, I can tell you certainly, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but I can tell you for sure one of the things that – um, I always have, I, str- I struggle with is convincing any number of my students that they need to do rewrites. They get mm-hmm. la- they get lazy or they've got too much to do or whatever it is, and they just don't do enough rewriting. And right. uh, that's really where the, the, the really artistic part of this and the great craft part of it really comes in is, is in the rewrite process. And yeah, rewriting is craft. That's, there's no doubt about it. You know, you can be a genius and put out a first draft that's got some genius in it. But unless you know your craft, you're not going to be able to show that to somebody and have them understand what your genius is. Mm-hmm. So uh, there's genius and craft. And until you get to the craft stage, and that requires some education and that requires some writing. You don't really, uh, I've heard people say, you don't really find your voice until five or six um, scripts, not drafts, five or six scripts. So you, in each draft, you don't really find that perfect script, or at least as good as you can do on that script, till I would say eight or ten is the minimum, eight right. or ten drafts of the same script. You don't really find what you're really looking for. Yet. I, I have, my, in, at least in my experience, it's been for me to turn in what you would call your first draft to an editor or producer, whoever, that first draft for me is usually between 12 and 15 drafts, and then the notes come back and you're right. doing many more drafts. Right. I would agree. I, w- I would say that's about right. I'm 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 a fast writer, and I write short, so I don't always have to cut stuff. But I would say I don't even show it to my agent until I'm in about eight drafts. So, and to a producer, it would be certainly what you're talking about: twelve, fifteen drafts. Right. Uh, and I've done that, and then I've I've done twenty three, twenty four drafts. Then I've had a, a a development executive at a network say, and a brand new one. So I let me backtrack. I wrote. 22, 23 drafts under a development executive at a network who got fired. The new one came in <laughs> two days before production and said, no, I don't think that's really right. I, I want you to go this way. <laughs> and I had to write a complete new draft over a weekend. And I thought, oh, my God, what a fucking idiot. Now, in truth, he was a fucking idiot. But <laughs> you still have to write a draft towards your audience whoever that audience is, and it's usually an audience of one or two before it gets into the screen. And you have to please that person so that person can say, yes, we're going to make this picture. And that, and folks, that folks, is the essence of Hollywood right there. Yeah, and, we and that's are, the hard part. It is the hard part. You just have to keep digging in. So yeah. we've, we're coming toward the end of the show. We've been speaking to the... Uh, the great writer and teacher, Paul Chitlick. Um, Paul, I'm wondering if you might have one great piece of advice for our listeners, especially those trying to figure out how to make it in the world. Do you have, beyond all the wonderful things you've said, is there one piece of advice you might be able to share? Um, I think there is, and I'm not sure everybody's going to want to hear this, but I think you have to, these days, 
you can and should strike out on your own. Meaning, if you're a good writer and you've written something that you really find is the best expression of what you can do, and your friends and colleagues and whoever you can show to has said, yeah, this is pretty good, but you still can't get it sold, I say go out and buy a camera and make it yourself. Because these days you can buy a camera for under 500 bucks that will do it. That means that a, a, a digital single lens reflex that has sound recording capabilities. And if you get a good sound recordist, you can make a movie for under $1,000 if you know how to put it together. If you have one location and you have friends and family that can help you out, and cook and uh, prepare food for your people that are working on the script. And you can use uh, natural lighting or available light. If you have a good story that's confined to a small place and a small number of people, I say go out and make it yourself and show it to people. Then you can say, okay, I've done this. Now here's the other script that I want to do. I think that's the way to start. Paul, this has been just a true treat, and um, I really greatly appreciate you being with me on StoryBeat today and uh, sharing all of your experiences and your wisdom and knowledge. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. It was really great talking to you again. Today's StoryBeat tip. It's easy for writers of fictional prose to express what a character thinks, but screenwriters must be conscious of the fact that motion picture and TV audiences cannot see inside a character's thoughts. The audience can only perceive what a character does or says, not what he or she thinks. It's close to impossible for actors, even those with enormous talent, to accurately perform anything that a writer says the character thinks or realizes. That kind of detail is likely to be unplayable, making it pointless to write into a screenplay. That means screenwriters must only write about two senses sight, and sound. Further, because an audience can't smell, touch, or taste anything in a screen performance, those other three senses should not be indicated in a screenplay's action. Instead, it's best to focus on writing what characters do or do not do. Let the director and the actors figure out how to interpret the brilliant action you have crafted. And so we've come to the end of today's story beat. This podcast was made possible with the tremendous support of the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University. Special thanks go to Ashley Murray for her tireless assistance in helping to put this program together. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.